I don't want to work my entire life. So how can I hack my way to a shorter work life so that I can enjoy more of my life on my terms? Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today's episode is all about personal finance and investing and overcoming anxiety with money. So this was a very empowering episode. I'm excited for you to listen to it to help you get clear about your finances and create a plan for your financial future. Our guest today is Delian Barros. Delian Barros is an investing coach and the founder of Delian The Money Coach LLC. Growing up poor and as a Brazilian-born immigrant, she believed that money was something extremely difficult to earn, manage, and grow. After paying off $150,000 in student loan debt and becoming a millionaire, she now shares her knowledge with over 500,000 followers across all her social media platforms. Her signature program, Slay the Stock Market, teaches new investors how to become financially independent and retire early and has over 5,700 students enrolled. She has been named one of the most influential voices of money by time, and she was also the host of Diversifying, the first personal finance podcast produced by CNN. Before we begin, here's a quick reminder to check out the new 2023 Artist of Life workbook. If you're looking to change your life and have a guided plan to achieve all your goals in 2023, check out our new Artist of Life workbook at shop.lavendare.com. All right, on to the interview. Hello, Delian. How are you? Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited to have you and learn about money. So why don't you start by telling us your story on how you learned about money and became financially independent? Yeah, I think my story is probably similar to a lot of people's, which is I did not learn about money at school or at home or in college. You basically had to learn on a trial basis as you're living life. And you just get to a point in your life where you're like, okay, I'm making the kind of money that I've always dreamed of making, or, you know, I'm making more than I ever expected, but I'm not seeing anything happening. Like I'm, I still can't buy a home. My net worth isn't growing. I like, I don't understand, like, how is this all supposed to come together? And that's how I felt. I was an attorney successful working in New York city and I had $150,000 in debt in school loans, which from my understanding was everybody had student debt. So it wasn't anything to be like stressed about, but I was trying to like buy real estate in New York city, which was extremely challenging even before, you know, the pandemic and all of this happening. And I was just feeling very frustrated and disheartened by, I'm like, is this the only path? Like, is this the only way? And I was also very unhappy at my work. I just did not find the law like fulfilling, even though it was a huge accomplishment for me to make it. Once I finally did, I did not connect with that career. And I proceeded to be a lawyer for 14 years, realizing <laughs> oh my <that>. gosh. <laughs> I'm like, what else are you supposed to do? You have all right. these loans. Like, what and else you do you have so much time and money into that career? Exactly. So like and so much identity yeah. is like tied to that. Mm-hmm. Um, so just walking away from it just seemed like it was not an option. Yeah. Um, which of course was just, you know, my own ego or my own beliefs, um, getting in the way of that. But basically I just finally decided to get over my anxiety with money. And cause I'm sure that that's another thing people connect with. We all have a lot of anxiety when it comes to our money. And so we avoid money, right. Hoping that things will just work out. And I just thought, well, as long as I make, you know, X amount, all the other problems will resolve themselves. But here I am making six figures, high six figures, you know, exceeding that. And the problems are still there. And it's actually getting even more pronounced, right? Because it's like the more money you make, the more, the higher the stakes become. So I'm getting more and more stressed. And finally I decide, okay, that's enough. Enough is enough. What can I do to to, you know, really turn things around. And I started looking into paying off debt. I'm like, how are people paying off debt? You know? And then I found, I found the debt free community online. And that's usually like the gateway drug to financial independence. So you find the debt free community first, everybody talking about being super frugal and paying off debt really fast. And then you're like, okay, let me try that. And then you're like, this is terrible, right? It just feels so restrictive. And then finally, I found the financial independence community talking about investing and 
you know, investing and paying off debt at the same time. And I just started to find like my own way. And that's when I finally started to, you know, become more comfortable with money and actually have like goals attached to my money and plans attached to my money, not just like make money, save money, spend money, but like a much, much bigger picture, which has completely transformed my life, right? Like I'm about to move to Portugal in the next six months and wow. retire abroad, oh which is gosh. like never in a million years that I think that that was something that was in the cards for me until I started getting, you know, until I started working towards financial independence and discovering all these opportunities. So I am turning 40 this year. I arrived at this point, like late in life, I would say, um, and it's still possible, right? So even if you're, you know, you said a lot of your listeners are in their twenties and thirties, you guys like, don't wait <laughs> as long as I did, you know, to like overcome that anxiety over your money, because the sooner you face it, the easier it's going to be for you and the faster that you can reach your goals. Wow. There's so much to unpack in your story. And I, I want to learn everything that you learned. <laughs> like I, I wish you're able to share everything in one podcast. Um, let's, let's start with um, financial independence. Like what does that mean? And how, I guess, what did you learn that changed your mindset or approach with money? Yeah. The biggest like aha moment for me was, whoa, you can invest in the stock market and build this little nest egg that basically like replenishes itself. So you can pay yourself a salary, right? Instead of it coming from my employer, I can pay myself a salary and it will continue and the rest of it will continue to grow and, and replenish. Um, and I can live off of this little nest egg for the rest of my life. And I can retire early, right? Assuming that like I save and invest enough, I can retire early. And it sounds like so simple when you say it like that, but literally I had never heard anybody talk about this. Like nobody ever talked to me about it. Like people mentioned their 401ks, but again, like a 401k is something that you don't use until you're 60 years old. So I just assumed, hey, everybody has to retire at that age. The idea of like retiring at 40 or 45 never even crossed my mind. So when I did discover financial independence and that you can you know, divorce yourself from a nine to five and kind of do your own thing. That was a huge, huge, like mind blown moment for me. And that's what set me on that path to like start investing in the stock market and then eventually to me starting my business. So mm -hmm. those two things combined, investing in the stock market and starting my business catapulted me towards financial independence, which yeah. was incredible. That's amazing. So can you talk a little bit more about what do you mean by growing the nest? And like, I understand in investing in the stock market, but like, do you take money out? Like what's, what does that look like? So, you know, financial independence usually means that you can replace your income with your investments. Right. But a lot of people think are like, a lot of people think, oh, okay, well, I'll just save up to this amount and then you just take it all out of the stock market and then you live off of that, right? But no. So let's say you have a portfolio that's half a million dollars, $500,000. You would only take out a portion that you need to live off of for that year, right? So let's say, let's use a million dollar portfolio. If you have a million dollars, you can safely withdraw $40,000 a year for the rest of your life and it, you won't run out of money right? That's the theory. It's called the 4% rule. You can withdraw 4% of your portfolio, live off of that, and then your money will continue to grow and compound in the stock market. I see. That's what that means, that nest egg. Okay. So you're expecting that that 4% is less than what the amount that your money is going to grow each year. So it's, there's still compounding happening. Exactly. Because usually the stock market will grow like 10% a year, right? On mm -hmm. average over a long term. So it's not mm -hmm. like guaranteed every year you're going to get 10%. It's think of, think of 10% as like the GPA of the stock market. It's the GPA. So some years are the, the stock market is not going to do so great like this year. And some years it's going to do gangbusters, right? It's going to go over and above. It's going to be an A plus student. And some years the stock market's going to slack off and it's going to be a C student. It's going to have like that GPA average, right? So that's what that 10% is. So 10% is a lot more than 4%. So that's the whole idea behind it. So for example, this year is like a low year, right? So does how does this idea, this concept change with years where it's not growing? 
Right. So let's say I was retiring right now. So I saved my million dollars. I'm about to retire. It's 2022 and the stock market starts going down. People who plan for things like this, like early retirement, financial independence, they know that years like this are cyclical and they happen all the time, right? It's very common for we to, for us to have like a down year like this every four to five years. So you have mm-hmm. to anticipate and prepare. So people in that position usually will put some cash aside, usually like a year or two years of expenses so that they don't touch their portfolio when the market is really down. Like, why would I want to sell my stocks right now? I'm not going to get as much money if the stock market was recovered and up. Right. So instead, I want to use cash during these years and not rely on my stocks. Mm -hmm. The other option, again, is, you know, worst case scenario, you go get a part time job and you go supplement your income again. Right. You don't have to go back to like the nine to five grind, but maybe you go pick up some part time work. That's the thing about early independent, early retirement. It's the word retire, I think, really freaks people out because they're like, that's it. That's the end point. You're never going to work again. And it's actually not the case. Like people actually become really creative about the ways that they make money and they try to create income streams that are always going to be available for, for unpredictable times like the ones we're having right now. Okay. I understand. So it's not that every year you're taking out a certain amount. It's like you, it, it changes depending on the situation. This is essentially the FIRE movement, right? F-I-R-E. Just so for people who don't know what that is, can you explain what it is and, and how do people get started? Right. So fin- FIRE stands for financial independence, retire early. But I like to say relax early again, because that word retire has that negative connotation of like, my life is over. I'm sitting, you know, now I'm sitting on the couch or watching Netflix or I have nothing to contribute to society, which is the complete opposite, right? So it's really about relax early and also giving you way more options. Like you now, the world is your oyster. You can decide whether you want to work. Some people love what they do, but choosing what you do versus having to go to work are two different things, right? Like Mm -hmm. choosing to go to work versus having to go to work. So, um, and some people love what they do, but they don't want to work 40 hours a week. They only want to work 20 hours a week. Cool. You have that option, right? So financial independence is all about having options and choices and using this 4% rule. That is a guideline, right? Like we said, some years you might take out 3%, some years you might take out 5%. It all, you have to be flexible and you have to, you know, be prepared But it's basically like a movement, a group of people who have this type of mentality of like, I don't want to wait till I'm 65 years old to stop working and then, and then enjoy my life. Mm -hmm. Right. I want to know what that's like much sooner. I want to travel or I want to explore different options or I want to have a career change, whatever. Right. And I don't want to wait until I'm 65 to do that. Especially when we think about the, you know, the life expectancy in America is about 80 years old. So that's it. You work your whole life and then you've got 15 years and if you're lucky, you're in good health and you actually Mm -hmm. get to enjoy those 15 years. Right. But many people aren't. Um, so you're, you know, you might be homebound, you might be dealing with a disability, who knows, but this is something where, um, I think like millennials and Gen Zers are starting to connect with this idea of like, I don't want to work my entire life. So how can I, hack my way to a shorter, you know, work life so that I can enjoy more of my life on my terms. Yeah. I love this concept. I felt like I've always, I didn't know this term, but even in my early twenties, I was like, I don't want to work like so hard, like 40 hours a week. I don't want that corporate lifestyle. I need, like, I want to be able to travel more. So, (laughs) so with this concept, I mean, how do people get started? Is it about saving money and starting to invest in the stock market? Right. So Um, that's one way. And I want to be super clear that I don't want to tell people like, Hey, you can only become financially independent. If you invest in the stock market, there are many paths to financial independence. You can do it by starting a business. You can do it by, um, investing in real estate, right? There's Mm -hmm. lots of ways you can become financially independent, but I share the way I'm doing it because, um, that's what I'm familiar with. So I'm sharing my knowledge and my experience and the way that I'm doing it is through the stock market, which I believe is really, people love to say passive income for everything. But to me, the stock market is the only true passive income. Like you put money in the stock market, you literally don't have to do anything else. Like you just go buy something and that's it. You're done, Mm -hmm. right? Whereas other types of income, a business, real estate, 
it takes work. You got to put in work. Yeah, exactly. So just being transparent about that. So with the um, stock market, a lot of people are like, okay, that sounds great. What, where do I start? So the best place to start is probably somewhere you've already started, which is like your workplace 401k. You, a lot of people don't even realize that that's invested in the stock market, right? I get that question all the time. People are like, oh, does my 401k count? I'm like, yes, it does, right? And the fact that you didn't know that tells me so much. It tells me that like the stuff is not being explained to us. So you may already be investing in the stock market. You don't even realize it. The other, you know, um, ways by opening a Roth IRA, and people are like, what's that? It's just an account that holds your money. And then you go and buy investments inside of that account, right? So you go to like an online broker, like a Fidelity or a Vanguard, you open a Roth IRA, you deposit money from your checking account. And now it's time to actually buy the investment, right? Because the Roth IRA is not the investment. This account is just literally like a savings account that holds your money. So now it's time to buy the investment. So you're like, okay, well, what do I buy? Do I buy Tesla? Do I buy Amazon? Do I buy Apple? And I'm like, how about you buy everything? How about you buy all of it? And then you don't have to choose, right? Again, what are we doing? We're trying to get the average of everything the stock market's doing. We want to get that 10%. How do you get that 10%? By buying everything. You buy the good ones and the bad ones, but it averages out in the end to 10%. So you're going to get some duds and you're going to get some awesome companies, but it's all going to average out. And you do that by buying something called an index fund or an ETF. And that's going to have hundreds, if not thousands of companies in there. And boom, just like that, you own the entire stock market and you just keep putting money in every month. Every time you get paid, you put some money in, you keep putting money in and then you start growing your nest egg. Mm -hmm. And in terms of ETFs, like how... How do you, I know there's different types, right? Do you just recommend buying the one that's like the entire S&P or are there, do you recommend different types of ETFs? Like how, yeah, what's, what do you think? You know, the traditional, like if you're a long-term investor and you just like want to be a buy and hold traditional investor, you're buying the entire stock market, which means you're not just buying the S&P 500. You're actually, because the S&P 500 is just 500. Oh, companies. the top 500, right. Exactly. Right. But, if you buy the entire stock market, you actually end up owning 4,000 companies, oh, right? I so you're actually capturing more of the stock market. Um, and so, but they, uh, they have very similar returns. So I don't mm-hmm. want anybody to panic if they're like, oh my God, I've been buying the S&P 500 this whole time. Did I mess up? No, you didn't mess up. They're very similar. Um, I just prefer the total stock market because it captures more. It gives you more opportunities there, diversifies you more, Right. So I, that's what I tell people to look at is a total stock market. And then you got to think about how many bond, how much in bonds do you want to add to your portfolio? Usually somebody in their twenties, just starting out, they'll have something like 10 to 15% in bonds in their portfolio. And the rest will all be stocks. That's a typical, you know, um, portfolio for somebody in their twenties and thirties, but it could vary from person to person. Right, right. And I understand investment is such a personalized thing. Like there's no right or wrong way. It's like something can work great for one person and something could be, you know, it's different per person. I want to learn about your investment journey as well. Like what would you say are the biggest lessons that you've learned in your journey that you wish you knew in the beginning? I think I, um, everybody underestimates, right? How much you're going to be susceptible to like FOMO, like when 2020 and 2021, there was so much hype, so much hype around all these crazy stocks, right? People were talking about GameStop and there was NFTs and crypto and everybody's just pulling you in all these different directions. And you're like, which one, which one? And it's, I don't, I think I underestimated how powerful that is, right? We're all on social media more than ever. And you're hearing all of these mixed, mixed messages. I mean, you've got like, your aunt's uncle's cousin coming to you and talking to you about crypto. And you're like, well, it sounds like everybody's doing this stuff. So I should be doing it too. So it's really easy to be distracted by something like hot and exciting, you know, really, really easy. And I kind of gave into that in the beginning too. Like I was buying individual stocks, right? I thought I knew how to pick stocks. I thought that what I didn't realize is if And I think a lot of people didn't realize is that in 2020, you could have picked almost anything. Yeah. Everything went up. Yeah. Yeah. You thought you were smart, but like literally everything did well. 
literally everybody thought they yeah. were Warren Buffett. They're like, Warren yeah. Buffett? Ha, what does that guy know? I yeah. yeah. So yeah. people are feeling very, very confident. And then you have a year like the one we're having and you start to see, oh, crypto is down like 70%, right? You've got mm-hmm. individual stocks. You've got Meta, Facebook, one of the biggest companies in the world. Its stock is down 70%. So all of a sudden, all these theories and ideas that you had about investing, you start to realize, oh my God, I, I know a lot less than I thought I did. And that's where people get disheartened and then they feel burned out from the stock market. And they're like, oh, I guess this is a scam. I guess this is like a casino and this doesn't work. And then they give up, right? So that's what I don't want to see people doing. Um, and by the only way you avoid that is by not giving into FOMO. So I know index funds like don't sound sexy. Like nobody's excited when they talk about index funds. Like you don't, you see people's eyes like glaze over and they're like, that sounds boring. You, you just buy the same thing every single month and that's it. And I'm like, yeah, that's it. And, but that's what works. Yeah. It's the long term. Like it's, it's like tried and true almost. Yeah. So what I tell people is like, listen, if you want to get excitement, do that somewhere else. Like go on a roller coaster, go to Vegas and gamble, like go, go on a crazy vacation, you know, go bungee jumping, but don't do it in your investment portfolio. Like that's not where you should be getting like your endorphin kick. You know, it's not in your investment portfolio. Go get it somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Okay. So your, your course is called how to like slay the stock market. So I want you to share some tips, like your best tips for beginners and then also later for longtime investors. Yeah. I think with beginners, it's again, it's starting with the foundation, you know, like what am I doing here? Why am I putting this money in the stock market in the first place? That's the first question you have to answer because if you are immediately going into it thinking, Ooh, I'm going to invest so I can pay off this credit card. You're already in trouble. You're already eh, like, stop right there. Like you're already in trouble because that's not how investing works. Like you need to commit to leaving this money in for like 10, 20 years. Right. So immediately your mindset needs to be like, Hey, not going to see this money for 10 years. Buy money. You know, like I'll see you in 10 years. So Mm -hmm. immediately, like that's the first thing you need to focus on is your mindset. And you need to like have a goal to work towards. Otherwise you're kind of throwing money in these accounts with like, you know, without really understanding, like, am I investing enough? Am I investing too much? Am I investing too little? Like people have no idea. Right. So what's the goal here? Like, when do I stop investing? When do I know it's enough? That's all about like figuring out that fire number. What is your fire number? If you don't know your fire number, then what are you doing? Right. So I always tell people it's your annual expenses times 25. So just know okay. that, that formula, annual expenses times 25. Again, annual expenses based on who you are today as a 20 year old. Cool. But that's not going to be change in 20 yeah. to 30 years. Right. So that number is going to be changing. Like you're oh, going to have to recalculate it every couple of years and be like, you know what? I, I actually think I'm going to need more. You end up having a kid. Oh, I have a kid now. Let's mm-hmm. raise that number again. You know? So you have to be flexible. Um, so I think that that's the first thing is, you know, just have your why and make sure that your mindset is right. And then for longer term investors, it's the the hardest thing for a long term investor to do is nothing. <laughs> nothing. Because they think they need to be doing something, right? Like right now, everybody's panicking, thinking like, what should I be doing? What should I be doing? My portfolio is down 20%. I keep telling them the only thing you should be doing is exactly what you have been doing for the last however many years. You need to keep buying. Keep Mm. buying. People are like, oh, should I lower my contribution? Should I slow down? Should I wait for the market to bottom and then I'll put more money in? Nope. Because you don't know when these things are going to happen. So what you should be doing is just continuing to stick to your plan. The minute that you think that you can do something to get ahead of a stock market loss you're already doing too much, right? So just so just doing nothing is probably going to be the most challenging thing for a long-term investor. Right. So you're just all about like stay consistent, stick to the plan, regardless of whether it's a good or bad year. Because it's, it's simple, really. I, I think people want to like strategize and do all these other things. Look at TikTok, look at YouTube. There are literally channels and channels and channels like dedicated to giving people like stock tips and like what's going to happen next, right? And people love that stuff. 
but they don't realize that all of that is speculation. Like that person is literally running a hypothetical. Like they don't know, you know, and people are actually terrible at predicting what the stock market's going to do. They're actually really, really bad at it. They sound really smart when they say it. And you're like, this guy sounds like he knows what he's talking about. They don't know. <laughs> right, right. Right. Like an index fund will kick their butts every single time. Mm. Every single time. And you guys can look this up. Like this is not, I didn't make this up. I didn't invent an index fund. I wish I did. Mm. Um, this is stuff that's been around for decades. Mm. So the data is there and it will show you that like stock picking loses out to index fund investing all the time. Mm, I see. Okay. And I also understand we're now going into like recessionary time. So let's talk about that. Like how to prepare for recessions with your finances and does it change your investing strategy at all? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of people would agree that we're already in a recession. Okay? Right. Like, right. But- yeah. We're not seeing growth, right, in our yeah. economy. And that basically, if you see that for two quarters in a row, boom, that means recession. So we're in a recession. But I do think that there, there's a high chance that it's going to get worse, right, that we're going to see more layoffs. We're already starting to see layoffs kind of speed up. And um, inflation is still not in control. Like the Fed has not been able to control inflation. It's still out of control. Gas is still high. Food is still high. So I think it is going to be more painful before it finally corrects itself. So you need to be preparing right now, right? Don't assume that just because you've been at a job for five years or 10 years that you're safe. You're like, oh, no, I would never get laid off. They love me. I'm irreplaceable. Oh, that's the biggest mistake you can make. Don't ever think like that. Everybody's replaceable from the CEO all the way down. So you really want to be preparing right now. You should be stocking, you know, you should be putting away some cash. So minimum, minimum three months of expenses. I would raise that to six months um, or higher depending on what industry you work at. So if you work in an industry that's very volatile or it would be very difficult to find another job, you want that you want that solution fund is what I call it instead of emergency Mm. fund. I like to call it a solution fund. You want it to be even bulkier right? Depending on your industry. So that's like the priority. The other one is if you have a little extra to throw on debt, this would be a good time to be throwing extra money on debt, especially credit card debt, because as interest rates go up, because the Fed's been raising interest rates, that means credit card interest rates are going up. So if you're carrying a balance on your credit card, you're paying even more interest than you were a year ago. Right. So pay off right. debt ASAP if you pay can. Pay off debt as much as you can. Yeah. yeah. And continue to contribute to your investment accounts as much as you can. Right? You're like, wow, so I'm supposed to save, pay off yeah, debt. Yeah, there's a lot there. <laughs> How much right. money do I have? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot. And then live your life, right? And then right. it's a lot. Like it's it takes time to find a balance between all of these goals. And again, some things will take priority over others. Right. Some like I think the emergency, the emergency fund, the solution fund is the ultimate priority. So if that means that you have to pause other goals to build that, do that. Right. And then you can move on to like paying off debt and also throwing some money in investments. I'm a big fan of doing both at the same time, investing and paying off debt. But again, if you want to focus on one versus the other, that's okay too. like do what works for you. But those need to be like the priorities right now. And then you want to do anything you can to secure the job that you have, right? You want to make sure that things are good at work. You're you're communicating with your employer. You're on good terms. Um, You don't want to wait till like a year-end review to know if you're doing a job. You should know like throughout the year if things are good. And you want to be asking your manager like, you know, um, How's the company looking? Are there any plans to restructure? You know, you want to try to get a sense of what's going on. Keep those resumes fresh. Um, If you haven't freshened it up in a while, I would freshen it up. Um, And I would keep your eye on job boards and things like that. You have to be prepared because you never know what might be coming. And if there's any way to, you know, start a side hustle and have some extra income coming in on the side, I would also encourage people to do that. I know that not everybody can because some people work 50, 60 hours a week and then they come home and then they have to take care of their kids. They're like, when am I supposed to do a side hustle? So I understand it's harder for some people, but if you're in a position where you can get a side hustle off the ground and make some extra cash, this would be the time to do that. 
Yeah. Amazing. I love that your tips are like so, so meaty. Like there's so much there <laughs> and listeners, you can listen back. There's a lot of good tips in there. Um, okay. So y- I checked out your other podcast, Diversifying. And in the description, it says you talk about how traditional rules of money management no longer apply to new generations. So what do you mean by that? Cause I do feel like things are shifting. Maybe old rules don't apply anymore. So what are, you know, can you give us examples of that? Yeah. I mean, our grandparents, you know, maybe not so much our parents, depending on what generation you are, but parents and grandparents, they lived in a different world. You know, like homes were like, my parents bought a a two bedroom, two bath condo for like $50,000. And they were like immigrants with no money. It was possible back then to like work minimum wage and buy a house. And now it's like absolutely impossible. Right. So this idea of like, buying a home is, you know, the American dream and you, you need to buy a home to build wealth and you're throwing money away. If you're renting, that's no longer true. That is no longer true. Especially when you look at the housing market, it's crazy. It's, you know, incredibly overpriced and we have 7% interest rates on these mortgages. So, you know, the one thing I want people to know is I am a millionaire and I rent Mm -hmm. and I live in California. Okay. So you don't have to believe in that like myth or that rule that you have. Absolutely not. Like depending, it's very geographic specific, very, very specific to where you live. Depending on where you live, it may not make sense to buy. Mm -hmm. Right. And I don't want you to think that buying a home automatically means that it's a good investment. There are a lot of people who buy homes and they lose money on their houses. Mm-hmm. A lot of people, right? They they don't even realize because who keeps a spreadsheet of every cost that goes into their house? Nobody, yeah. okay? <laughs> Very rarely do you meet people like that where they're like, all they think about is the price that they bought it at and then the price that they sold it at. And I'm like, okay, but well, what about all the other stuff that happened in between? The new boiler and when you change the carpets and all the trips to Home Depot, they like, oh no, that, that doesn't count. And I'm like, mm, right? So the home buying, I think, is like the big one. The other thing is our parents had like pensions. They literally didn't have to invest for their retirement. They didn't have to think about it. They had pensions that were guaranteed. They would work for a company for 30, 40 years. And then they just got to retire and they got a pension. And they collected Social Security on top of that. And they were fine. They were good. We don't have that anymore, right? It's like the systems are broken. They don't work anymore. (laughs) Pensions gone. We have these 401ks that it's on us now to put money in. It's on us to understand them. Social security is diminishing by the minute. I don't even know if it's going to be around by the time we retire. Inflation's out of control. Prices are out of control. So the rules that apply to our parents, which is like, just work for 40 years, get a good job, climb the corporate ladder, buy a house. That stuff is not not happening anymore. It's not working. So we have to think more creatively about how we're going to live life, right? And manage our money. And that means doing stuff that like our parents may not understand. So they may look at you and be like, why are you doing this? And it's like, yo, things have changed since you've been in my shoes, you know? So going against your parents' advice, you know, can be can be, you know, like a a cognitive dissonance at times, but understand that it's, things have completely changed and it's okay to push back on that. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. It's like for people who just listen to their parents and think they just can stick to the rules and live a good life. Like the world is not the same anymore. So I, yeah, I feel like that was very eye opening. Yeah. And like, like the other thing where just stick to one company and, and be loyal no, like you actually need to be changing jobs like every two to three years mm. and getting raises and job right. hopping is like one of the best ways to increase your income. That's something that would probably horrify your parents if you went to them yeah. and told them that, right? Yeah. They're like, exactly. what? what do you mean change jobs every two to three years? That's crazy. Now it's very common, very common. Wow. So we just yeah. have to be you know, flexible with what's going on in our economy and our environment. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about emotion. You mentioned you have anxiety with money and like, you know, that emotional relationship with money is such a crucial thing that I think people overlook. Like they don't realize how much they're holding themselves back in their mind. So what barriers did you face with, you know, emotional barriers and then how did you get over them? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'm an immigrant. My parents are immigrants. I immigrated here from Brazil when I was eight years old. 
And so I grew up in a house where money was very scarce, which again, I'm sure a lot of people did as well. So I grew up hearing that we just didn't have it. Whatever you asked for that was extra, we don't have the money for it. Don't even ask because we don't have it. So money was seen as something that was very scarce and it was only for necessities and extras were just not available. And so I brought that anxiety around money, that scarcity into adulthood, right? So I would, I would vacillate like between spending a crazy amount of money. As soon as I would get the money, I would spend it because I'm like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to lose it and it's going to be gone. So let me just go spend it. And also just having money for the first time in my life. I was like, oh my God, I have money for the first time and you just want to spend it. And then I went the other opposite direction, which was like, I was hoarding money. I would just save, 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 save. And then the more you save and the more you see it increasing in your bank account, the more anxiety you get because you're like, oh my God, what if I lose all of this? And it's Mm -hmm. like, and then when the time came, and so I, I hoarded a lot of money into a savings account for a long time. When the time came for me to pay off my student loans, which meant like throwing big, I was throwing like thousands and thousands of dollars into my student loans on my student loans every month to pay it down. For me to get to that point, I had to believe that I was going to make more money again, right? Because paying down debt means overcoming your scarcity mentality. Because if you believe that you will never make that money again, you're never going to let it go and let it go towards things like paying off debt or investing because you want to hang on to it, Mm -hmm. right? And so Nobody ever told me that, wow, paying off debt means that I have to overcome my scarcity mentality. I have to believe in myself enough that I'm going to make more money, that I'm going to make that money back and then some, Mm -hmm. right? And once I was able to, to overcome that, I was able to pay off my student loans. I was able to start putting money into the stock market because when you have fear in your money and you like, you strangle your money, it will never grow. Like when you strangle something, it can't thrive, right? Because you're strangling it. So you actually have to let it go in order for it to like grow and thrive and like actually make you more money. So overcoming whatever limiting beliefs you have around money is extremely important so that you can make decisions that will actually help you instead of holding you back. Yeah. It's like, you have to believe it, it will come back. Like you're going to be able to make it back. It's money just flows. Like don't, don't hold on to it so tight. I love that like metaphor of strangling. It can't grow it, you, if you're strangling it. Yeah. What, are there any other common emotional barriers that you see with people? I mean, there's so many, there's so much money trauma that I think people have not pinpointed. I did one, uh, one of the episodes that I did on diversifying was about money trauma where, you know, um, one of the listeners that we were interviewing grew up like in an abusive home. And she saw how her parents abused her, the kids by spending money on themselves and telling the kids that they didn't have any money, right? Like they wouldn't even have money for food. And then the parents would go and spend money on themselves. Like they would just blow Mm -hmm. through the money. So that, so she was so afraid to spend money that she wouldn't even like buy herself new clothes. She would be afraid to buy new clothes because she would see a jacket and she would see the price tag. And she's like, I can buy um, three loaves of bread with this and two packets of cheese. And she could, she would see food, right? She would look at a jacket and she would see, wow, I can buy so much, this much food. And so until she made that connection that that's what she was doing in her mind, she wasn't able to like really enjoy her money. And she was, she was doing very well. She had a great job Mm -hmm. where she was a creative director and she was making good money, but she couldn't get herself to the point where she could spend it and enjoy it. So I think we talk a lot about saving and paying off debt, but we don't talk about how to like spend money. You know, how do we spend money in a way that's joyous in a way that doesn't cause stress in a way that it doesn't trigger, you know, some fear in us like that's a skill too. Right. And so therapy is obviously amazing. I think therapy is something that will help you if you have this kind of money anxiety I highly, highly recommend therapy because it will help you work through a lot of this. And a lot of therapists are starting to talk about financial trauma and, you know, how that's impacting your money. I, they're seeing a lot more of that. So um, I would definitely, definitely seek out help. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a big part. I I think everybody has some sort of belief about money and it's, it's, I think everybody has to overcome some sort of 
whether it's habits you picked up from your parents or beliefs you picked up from parents or someone, someone else. Yeah. Yeah. Some people like have the opposite experience where their parents always paid for everything and they always had a lot of money in the home. And now that they're out on their own, they're like, Oh, I don't have like this bottomless piggy bank to like dip into. And they're just blowing through each paycheck. Right. Because now they're believing that the money will always, always be there. And that's the other extreme, like, oh, money will always be there. So I'm just going to keep spending it. And I'm like, okay, well, you don't want to like go too much to that side either. You want to have a balance between the two. You don't want to be hoarding and you don't want to be spending everything. Everything's about balance. Yeah. Okay. I also love that you talk about more diversity in finance and how, you know, some marginalized groups maybe are taught to fear investing or they don't, it's just out of their world, right? So what are some... I guess, financial myths that you feel are keeping some groups out of financial freedom? And how do we solve this? I think, um, you know, the idea that the stock market is like a big casino and that it's something that the rich people do, that they just throw their money around, you know, that they don't respect money and that they just throw money into the casino. And sometimes they make money and sometimes they lose it all. Um, I think the 2008 crisis caused, you know, like reinforced a lot of those beliefs, obviously. Um, and that's something that I work really, really hard to, you know, like myth bust because especially with people of color, Latinos and black people, um, African-Americans, they do not invest enough in the stock market because they have been so abused and neglected by the financial industry, right? Um, they have been taken advantage of, there have been so many banks that have come into communities and taken advantage of, people who didn't have the financial literacy to like ask questions and understand. And again, back to the 2008 crisis. So they are distrusting of the financial institutions with reason, right? So for me to come in and show, Hey, I'm a woman of color. I am putting my money in the stock market. Look at me, I'm doing it. And I put my money where my mouth is. I'm trying to show them that this is something that is available to us. And it's, you know, it's not as scary or it's not like for them and not for you. It's for all of us. It's very, you know, it's, it's where your money is actually the most equal in anywhere in the world, right? Like my share of Apple, whatever, let's say I buy one stock of Apple. It's worth just as much as anybody else. Like a billionaire can go into the stock market and buy one share of Apple and I can go buy a share of Apple and our shares are going to be equal. Like they're equal. Whereas like if you buy a home, homes are not always equal, right? Like there's so much race discrimination when it comes to um, home ownership. Like that's very well documented where a family of color will try to sell a home and then a family, a white family will try to sell a home and they get two different prices. Right. So very, very, you know, unfortunately discrimination is something that is pervasive in the system. So I'm just trying to show people like, yes, you have reason to distrust the financial institutions, but we can still work within this not perfect system, right? We just have to educate ourselves. Yeah, it's hard because I think everybody knows our system is not perfect and there are people taking advantage of the system, right? All like Wall Street and all these big companies. But at the same time, you're in the system, so you can't just pretend you're not in it, right? So you might as well learn how to work it and learn how to operate in it. I'm not here trying to defend capitalism. I know that capitalism has its problems, right? I'm not trying to say that it's a perfect system at all, but it's the system that we're in and we're all compromised. We're all in this system. We have to do the best thing that we can within the system. And we can still like criticize and hold corporations um, accountable and want to push for like more laws and regulation. We can do all that while still trying to thrive, within capitalism. Like those things are not mutually exclusive, you know, like there is no dignity in staying poor. There's no dignity in like keeping yourself poor, like intentionally, like I'm not going to make money because money is evil. There's no dignity in that, you know, that's a really hard life to live. Um, and I understand there's a lot of greed. I'm not saying you need to like be greedy, but again, balance, right. There's a big Mm -hmm. difference between being greedy and then living in poverty. Like there is yeah. there. Basically, there are a lot of resources and platforms out there like the stock market that people can be a part of 
And it's just a matter of like educating yourself and, and getting involved. And I think a, a big part is just the awareness and education for, for some groups, because some groups are like, oh, I don't even want to learn about it because it's for rich people. When, when in reality, like you said, like it's for everyone. I think that's what's really important is just like, just educating people what they can, how they can get involved now, like with what's out there. And I want to acknowledge that investing is very much a privilege, right? It is a privilege. Like most people are living paycheck to paycheck. They can barely pay their bills. So I want to acknowledge that that, that, that situation is very true. And it's not fair to go to somebody who's living paycheck to paycheck, barely getting by working 50, 60 more hours a week. Because let me tell you, the people who earn minimum wage, they work harder than anybody. So it's not about working hard. Um, and they, they can invest, right? If you came to me when I was 21 years old and I was making $28,000 a year and you told me about a Roth IRA in the stock market, I'd be like, that's really nice, but I'm barely getting by, you know? And that's the situation that people are in. But there are other people who have been able to kind of escape that paycheck to paycheck cycle. And they do have some extra cash and they just either don't know what to do with it or they're fearful or, you know, they're just overwhelmed. And I want, you know, if you were able to ex escape the paycheck to paycheck cycle, that's a huge, huge accomplishment. And yeah. I want you to like go to the next level now, which is building wealth, right? You're entitled to that. You have a right to do that, to pursue that. And it's a privilege to be able to do that. And I don't want you to waste that opportunity because there are so many people behind you, below you, who wish they had that opportunity. Like, I wish I had 50 bucks or a hundred bucks to invest in the stock market. They literally don't. Yeah. Um, I mean, what, what else do you have to say on how we can kind of make this system work for us and feel empowered despite all of these barriers, despite the fact that it's imperfect? Yeah, I think the best thing you can do is just knowing your own ecosystem, right? Like, don't get overwhelmed with everything that's going on in the world. I think that's the that's the way to like really become like to have analysis paralysis. You're like, oh my God, there's so much going on in the world. I can't process it. So I'm not going to think about it. Bring it back down to like you. Like, let's start with you. Do you know your ecosystem? Most people don't even know how much money they spend every month. Like they don't even know, like they know how much money they make and, but they don't really know what's going out the door. So where's your money going? Like, what's your biggest expense category? You know, is there somewhere that like where you've been emotionally spending that maybe you can cut back on, right? Because a lot of us, we spend to appease like stress, boredom, whatever. We want a serotonin high. It feels good to hit buy, right? On mm -hmm. your phone and then get a, a package in, at, the, at the door like it's Christmas. You're like, that feels good. So is there something else that you can replace that habit with? Instead of mindlessly shopping, can you do something else? And so just get to know yourself, get to know mm -hmm. your ecosystem and start there, right? Then you can start branching out beyond that. Maybe that means helping out a partner um, or a spouse or a family member or a friend, you know, but right now let's just focus on you and under, it's like putting on your mask on first before you put on somebody else's mask. That's what we're doing. Yeah. It's great. Cause I think people forget that they, like, you can get super clear about how you're spending your money, where your money is, where it's going. Most people don't even do that or know how to do that. No, literally I was listening to another podcast where somebody was, they were married for 18 years and the husband made the money and the wife spent it. And he had no idea where the money went and she had no idea where the money came from. It was the most, it was the most bizarre thing. I was like, wow, it's like they, they've been together for 18 years and it's like two separate entities operating like the right <laughs> hand and the left hand is doing. So just communicating like those two sides is already like a huge accomplishment. Right, right. Um, do you have any like favorite financial tools, apps, websites, things like that, that you want to share? Yeah. I mean, there's so many, I think that there's, first of all, there, I love podcasts. So obviously podcasts I think are fantastic. So if you, if you want that tons of podcasts out there, I have a whole free guide with, um, a ton of resources listed in it. So if you guys just go to my Instagram, the link in my bio, there's, um, a get You can get my free guide, tons of resources, books, right. And YouTube channels, all that stuff. But I love like reading books, like 
the Bogleheads Guide to Investing, or I Will Teach You to Be Rich. And there's so many more new ones that are coming out too, which are written by women, which I'm so excited about. Like the financial industry is really changing and growing, which um, excites me. And I think like start with your education, just start getting used to the vocabulary of this world because people think it's math. And that's another thing that intimidated me. I was like, oh my God, I hate math. I went to law school to avoid math, but it's not math actually. It's like 80% vocabulary. So once mm. you start getting used to some of this wording, like we threw out a lot of vocab here today, you, yeah. words that you probably never heard before. You read one personal finance book, you will know these words. Like, And then all of a sudden this world is not going to seem so terrifying and overwhelming. Yeah. It's, it's like going to a new country and not knowing the language. It's true. And, and people say like the, these industries, like the finance industry, they purposely create these like complex words because they know people are going to be intimidated and not even try to learn it. Right. It's, it's kind of like a tactic. Oh, I'm going to make it sound complicated. So you have to pay me to teach you how it works or to, to do it for you when it's, you know, most of it can be learned. So I mean, I just want to empower anyone listening. Like, don't, I think that's the first barrier is like, you think it's scary. You think it's hard. Like try to like throw that thought away. (laughs) Like it doesn't have to be scary or hard. Anyone can do this. The things that you do at work every day are harder than this. Anybody can learn how to invest. Like what you do for, if you went to school and you took some SAT tests and you did all that, that is harder than learning (laughs) how to invest. So I try to like tell people, I'm like, it's really not that scary. It's literally gatekeeping. Like you said, they created a whole new language to gatekeep this information, to make it seem like it's, you know, you need professionals to do this for you. You do not. Um, So it's just a matter of like just getting past that vocab, you know, road bump, and then you'll be able to figure this out. Love it. Love it. Okay. Um, what would you say, like, if you were to leave the listeners with one final piece of advice, what would that be? I would say, like, allow yourself to dream a little bigger. You know, sometimes in life we tend to just focus on like day-to-day survival, which I understand, especially if you're like struggling. But if you allow yourself to dream a little bigger, you might find yourself like stretching your goals a little bit more. You might find yourself taking some more chances. I wish I had taken more chances when I was younger. I was deathly afraid of changing jobs, even though I was miserable at work. I've only had two jobs um, since I graduated law school. Like that's unheard of, right? For 14 years, I only had two different jobs. Um, I wish I had job hopped more. I wish I had taken more chances. I wish I had taken more risk. I feel like your 20s, is your time to like take risks. Your 20s and 30s are your time. Um, Do that. If if it doesn't work out, so what? So you go out and you try something else. I think like do it now instead of having to do it in your 40s, 50s, and 60s when you're like, oh my God, it's going to be, it's almost too late. That's even worse. Like the stakes are much, much higher when you're older. So I would say do it, especially if you don't have kids (laughs) and you don't have a possibility to anyone this is your time to shine, you know, like be, be selfish and take some risks and don't ever choose a corporation over yourself. Mm -hmm. Don't ever choose your employer over your mental health, over your dreams. Never, you know, like it's just not worth it. Love it. I I totally agree. Okay. Delian, where can we (laughs) find you online? You can find me definitely on Instagram. That's like where I live most of the time, Adeli and the Money Coach. I'm also on TikTok and on Twitter. Um, and you can find my website, Adeli and the Money Coach.com. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thanks for dropping all this knowledge and this empowerment. I love what you do, supporting you. And, and yeah, thank you for being here today. Thank you. This was so fun. 